be with you once again. Uh, Luke 11 is where we're going to be. So turn your Bibles there. We're going to kind of conclude what we've been talking about the past couple weeks about prayer and uh, hopefully find some encouragement from the, the words of Jesus about our, our prayer lives. And definitely, you know, one of the uh, one of the tends to be one of the weaker areas of our, our, our spiritual lives is the area of prayer. There's a famous pastor who I really love, and uh, someone asked him, like, why he had never written on the topic of prayer. And he said, it's because I just constantly feel inadequate in this area of prayer. So anyone else out there feel inadequate when it comes to your, your prayer life? So today we get to talk about persistence. And one of the great examples of persistence I found <laughs> this past week is so good, so good. This guy was getting tired of constantly going to McDonald's and ha having their ice, ice cream machines busted. How many of you have experienced this? Like, now when you want that McFlurry or that McSunday or McCone, whatever the Mc ice cream deal you want. I mean, I remember one time I went to four McDonald's just to get my ice cream fix. <laughs> Every single one was like, sorry. Uh, can I help you? Welcome to McDonald's. Yeah, can I get a McFlurry? I'm sorry, ice, mach our ice cream machine's broken. How many of you experienced this? First world problem, right? Like. Four. I went to four McDonald's, right? So there's this guy I found out this week. Talk about persistence, right? He was so fed up with constantly going to McDonald's and having their ice cream machines broken, he created a website where he has now, and you can go to the website, it's called McBroken.com, no joke, <laughs> no joke. He has reverse engineered McDonald's internal API and currently placed in an order worth $18,000 plus every minute, every McDonald's in the U.S. to figure out which locations have a broken ice cream machine. <laughs> no joke, right? So to clarify how, I, to clarify how this works, McDonald's keeps track of which locations have a broken machine. I'm merely cure, uh, curing the, for those. No orders are get executed. No ice cream is actually wasted. But he's constantly got this every minute detecting what every McDonald's has as far as a working ice cream machine. So literally, if you click on his Twitter account, I'm clicking on it right now, I can pull up Arizona. What McDonald's should we look at right now in our neighborhood? Which one? Dobson and Warner. Okay, here we go. Dobson and Warner. What do you think? Working or not working? Why, did someone get one this morning and already knows about this? <laughs> Literally, look at, look at, there's Mesa. I'm clicking on it. Machine working. Yes! Here's the bad news, though. For Phoenix, 15% of the machines are not working right now. Talk about persistence, right, to come up with a program that is always finding out which ice cream machines are working or not working. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me just ask you real quick, a McDonald's ice cream machine working, how important is that for us to know in the big scheme of things, right? Would you say the persistence in this area is eternally valuable or eternally valueless? Yeah, I would agree too. Even though, I mean, we all want our ice cream, right? So afterwards, I know we're all going to like bombard Dobson and Warner McDonald's right now, <laughs> right? And break it, right? Yeah. So... I would say that persistence in developing technology to discover which ice cream machines are working at McDonald's, yeah, well, it may be fun to talk about and laugh about. What, what do we persist in in things that we want to know or maybe things we desire to have? I'm going to tell you right now that this man's persistence when it comes to McDonald's ice cream machines probably outweighs some of the persistence or lack thereof of things that are more serious in our lives and things that we're pursuing and things that we want and things that we go to God with. Would you say that perhaps persistence is lacking in our lives when it comes to our spiritual pursuits and spiritual disciplines? I think so. Jesus wants to encourage us in this area because I'm going to tell you and I'm going to argue this morning that perhaps the topic of persistence is the missing ingredient from our prayer lives. Let's look at Luke 11 and rather than me rattle on about it, let's, 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 hear, let's hear Jesus teach on some of the most unique teachings that we find in the gospel of Luke. But as far as recap, let's go back to verse 1, figure out where we've been in the past couple weeks, and conclude this section of prayer this morning with some really interesting pictures that Jesus gives us. So Luke chapter 11, starting at verse 1, it came about that while he was praying in a certain place, he had finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray, just as John teaches his disciples how to pray. So Jesus says to his disciples, when you pray, say, Father, 
hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who's indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. So those are great, great, great verses. We've looked at those over two weeks. But now we enter verse 5, check this out. He says to them, suppose one of you shall have a friend and shall go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And from the inside of the house, that friend shall answer and say, don't bother me, the door's already shut and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. We're going to call this guy the grumpy friend. Anyone got any grumpy friends in their lives? Okay, right. Verse 8, I tell you that even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, he will get up and give him what he's asking for because of his persistence. And I say to you, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks will receive and everyone who seeks will find. And everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Guaranteed promises right there in verse 9 and 10. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by a son for a fish, will you give him a snake? No. If he's asked for an egg, will you give your son a scorpion? No. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. So get ready for this. Three major points this morning. Two, we're going to get done in about two minutes. The fastest two points of a message you will ever hear from Scott Morgan. So <laughs> mark this day. Mark this day. First point is this. And this is just for recap review. Number one, there, we have to remember our position in praying. Our position in praying, verse two, Jesus says, when you pray, say, Father, nothing is more important than this point. Meaning your relationship with God is, is tantamount in this topic of, of praying. Your position as a child before a heavenly daddy, heavenly father, who cares for you more than you can ever imagine. This is the most delightful, most wonderful aspect of our praying is that we have a position to go to a dad who loves us more than we could ever imagine or understand. Is that awesome? So secondly, like I said, look how fast we're moving on. Point number two, our pattern for praying. And our pattern for praying is this. It's the Lord's Prayer, right? We pray, you know, Father, your, your name be glorified, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he says, give us this day our daily bread. You know, let us be forgiving people and then lead us not into temptation. Notice the priority, two things. We put God's interest first. Your pattern for praying is, this is not necessarily about you. It's about God's glory, God's name, God's kingdom, God's will. And once we understand that, then we can come in with our interests. We tend to get the two flip-flop, don't we? We go before God. We think this is about just airing out our laundry list before God. Here's what I need. Here's what I want. Here's what I desire. Here's what I yearn for, blah, blah, blah. But God says, stop. It is not about you. It is about me. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God, and then the rest shall be added to you. First, God's interest. Second, your interest. Point number three, hallelujah. We're on point three already, but don't get too excited and don't get thinking about that McFlurry right now. <laughs> it's broke. You just checked. Oh, darn it. So someone snuck out the back door and went and sabotaged the machine. All right. Point number three, our persistence in praying. And like I said at the beginning, this is what I'm going to argue for this morning. I'm praying that the Holy Spirit impresses this upon our hearts is that our persistence in praying is often the area that is th we, where, we, where we struggle when it comes to prayer. I mean, ever wonder why our prayers sometimes are not answered? Has anyone ever prayed something and you never got an answer or you didn't get the answer you wanted? Just raise your hand. I think we're all in unsafe company with each other. Here, I'm going to get mathematical on you. Not that I love math. I hate math. I ripped the book of numbers right out of my Bible. That's how much I hate it. I want you to write down this equation for me. Your position plus your pattern plus your persistence equals effective praying. Position plus pattern plus persistence equals effective praying. If any one of those three things is missing, you will not have an effective prayer life. And I'm going to argue that that persistent piece is the one area we tend to fall short in. The 
the reason we don't experience effectiveness in our prayer lives is because we, while we, we celebrate our position and we celebrate a pattern, we miss out on the persistence, the continuity, the, the, the brazen just, I'm going to persevere in this and keep going and keep going and keep going. How many of us pray one time for something and it's done? God's saying, don't. Don't stop. Keep going, keep going, keep going. This is what Jesus is going to argue about. Because here's the question. Essentially, how bad do you want something from God? How bad do you want something from God? Because here's what I know being a dad to three kids, that my kids are persistent with things. You know, it's like, Dad, can I have this? Dad, can I buy this? Dad, I? And the older they get, the more expensive it is. So, so I, I'm just going to plead hard of hearing eventually, you know. But here's the thing. I know how important or how necessary something is in my kid's life by the frequency of how, they, how much they ask for something. There have been times my kids have asked for one thing one time and that was it. And you know what I thought as a parent? That's not important to them. And then there are things that they hound me with continually. And if they're continually bringing something up, Dad, you remember yesterday I talked to you about this? Yes, I remember. Well, I want it. And they keep pressing it every single day. Now, that's a chance for me as a father to go deeper with my kids, not necessarily saying yes to what they want, but you keep asking me about this. Why is this important to you? Because the question is this, why is this necessary? Number two, is it urgent? Because if you think it's necessary and urgent, you're going to be persistent in your asking. But if it's not really necessary or urgent, guess what? You may ask one time and then you're going to forget about it. This is what Jesus wants us to do this morning in our hearts. He wants us to evaluate where we're at when it comes to our prayer lives. Because all I know, James chapter 4, verse 2, very simply puts it this way. The reason you don't have is because you don't ask. You know, some of us pray for really weighty, serious things. I'm praying for the salvation of a, of a friend. How persistent are you on praying for that friend? I'm praying for my marriage to be reconciled. How persistent are you praying for your spouse? Oh, I, I pray for my kids to walk with Jesus. How persistent are you in doing this? I'm praying for a new job. I'm praying for a new car, whatever. I'm praying for something that I feel is really, really important. The question is this, how persistent are you going to be in praying for that thing? Because here's what I'm going to show you. What you're going to discover in persistent praying is not getting what you want, but getting the God who satisfies more than the thing you want. So, number one, third point, our persistence of praying. Point number one, the determination of the asker. See, if you're not persistent in praying for something, it's obvious that we're not regarding it as something important or, or necessary. And so what we have to look at first is the determination of the asker. How determined are you? How necessary is the thing? How urgent is the thing you're pleading God for? So Jesus gives us an odd, odd parable. Verse 5. It's about a man who in the middle of the night, a visitor comes to his door, a friend, and according to customs, hospitality was a, a much prided thing. This guy has nothing. N notice in, in, in verse 6, and I want you to circle the phrase, I have nothing. This man is depleted of all his earthly resources. <laughs> and so what does he do? He can't turn the friend away because that would go against custom of the day and showing hospitality. So he goes to a friend. You wish there was a Circle K back in this day, don't you? Or at least like Waffle House. Let's just go grab some pancakes. Oh, do you guys remember Waffle House? Yeah, there's still time to make a bad decision today. Go to Waffle House, right? So, so this guy does what was customary is that you go to a friend's house. Now, it had to be at midnight, didn't it? And here's the friend who's gone to, to bed. They're in a single room dwelling place. The family, the kids, who knows what pets are there, right? They're all tucked in. It's probably a cold night outside. They're under their warm blankies, right? And all of a sudden, midnight. You ever got a, you ever got a knock on the door at midnight? You don't want to knock on the door at midnight. You ever get a phone call in the middle of the night? And your first response is like, oh, who's dead? Who's dead? Like, is the house on fire? What's going on? Like, you, it's, it's shocking. Person comes, friend, I need bread. I've got a visitor. The guy inside's like, dude, it's midnight. We're going to call the asker Barry. B you know, Barry's at the door. 
Larry, wake up. Barry and Larry, right? That, that works well together. No, n- nothing against you, Larry, okay? So uh, there had to be a Larry here, second service. There wasn't a first service. But Larry's like, hey, I've just gone to bed. I've just tucked the family in. I, I can't help you. Larry, I've got a friend. I need bread. And I, I smelled earlier your wife made some loaves. I, I can smell it. I need some of that bread because I have nothing. Finally, Larry goes, okay, stop knocking. Stop knocking. I'll give you what you need. And notice verse 8. He doesn't do it because this guy's a friend. He does it because he will not let up. He's persistent. Literally, the word, circle in your Bible, shameless. Only time it appears in the Bible. Unique. And shameless is not necessarily a negative word. Shameless is a good thing when it's attached to a good cause. See, shameless is this thing that says, I, I, I have this need, it's, it's necessary, it's urgent, and I'm going to ignore all sorts of social decorum to get what I want, even if it means make a ruckus in the middle of the night. So Jesus says, look at the determination of this guy. He finds himself suddenly called on to, res- to respond to a need he lacked the resources to meet and forced him to beg provision from someone he knew who had the resources. See, there are times in our lives when we have such need that we realize before God we, ha- we don't have anything and that he's the only one we can go to. Now, I understand this whole topic of hospitality. I spent a little bit of time in North Africa, a country called Tunisia, and I'm going to tell you one thing about the, the Middle Eastern culture and, and the, even the religion of, of Islam is that they pride themselves in hospitality. I remember going there, meeting up with some families, and these people, even though they just met you, it was almost like, come in, come in, sit down at my table, honey, get the dinner. And they just lay out this lavish feast. And then when you're done, you're thinking, hey, great to meet you. It's like, no, in about two hours, I'm going to have a boat on the Mediterranean. We want to go out and take a sail. And what are you doing? And all of a sudden, they want to adopt you into their family. That's like the attitude they have. And I remember even on a, on a trip from Tunis, which is the capital, down to the Roman ruins called Duga in, in Tunisia, just where they filmed the Star Wars desert scenes, Tatooine, that's pretty cool, right? We, got, we stopped on the road because there was a Tunisian soccer player who had nothing to do with this th- else to do with this time. He's like, here, let me join you, and I'll escort you all over the country. And get, it's like, that's the mentality, right? And here's a man who is in this social difficult place of not being able to show hospitality, but he knows how to fix the situation. Even though he has nothing, he's going to a friend who has what he needs. So he persists in asking. Two things I want you to notice here. And sometimes this is what prayer looks like. Prayer looks like a man going to his neighbor's house in the middle of the night because he's so depleted of his own resources. So number one, what does Jesus want us to understand? He says that shameless insistence can be a part of your prayer lives. Shameless insistence. And, and here's what I want you to think about. Remember, this is not speaking of the character of God. The emphasis is on the asker. And boldness in prayer overcomes the praying person's apathy. How many of you have grown apathetic sometimes in your prayer life? I have. How many of you have grown complacent? You've just lacked passion. You lack the sense of, like, I need to do this. And all I know is that boldness, Jesus says, boldness in praying conquers apathy. God never wants you to get to a place where you're like, yeah, it really doesn't matter. No. If you say it's necessary and if you say it's urgent, God wants to show you something in that. Don't play the complacency card, right? Because again, this has nothing to do with God's insensitivity. It has to do with an apathetic heart. Which brings us to the second point, and that's this. Boldness in prayer also brings about sincere confidence. Look at verse 9 and 10. Familiar verses, ask, seek, knock. But I think maybe we've lost maybe something or not understood something in these passages. Here's what sincere confidence does. Is that these, these words, ask, seek, knock, you see them there in verse 9 and 10? They're ongoing, continuous action words. Meaning, if you read it literally, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, and God says, don't stop. 
The problem is we pray for one thing and we don't get what we want and we stop praying. We may even pray for a few days. <laughs> Yay! And you still don't get what you want, we give up. Here's the thing you have to understand is that God is always going to move in your direction. And he's always going to show you something, or reveal something about your heart or what you think you need. And the sincere confidence comes in this. Prayer brings you to the heart of God. Prayer reminds you that we have a God who says, I am going to provide for you. And, and what sincere confidence bree breeds in our soul is this, this sense of satisfaction, even though we may not get what we want. The person who has their soul satisfied in God is the most content person in the entire world. Because it's not what you have, it's who you have. See, the sincere, bless you, sincere confidence grows and is enlarged in the heart of a person that says, I will keep on asking, I will keep on seeking, I will keep on knocking. Now notice those three words. There's an increase in intensity. My prayer life tends to be a decrease in intensity. How about yours? You, you're, you're like, I'm going to pray for you. And then all of a sudden, we're not as excited the next time. Or we may forget. The opposite is what Jesus is, is encouraging us to do. He says, when you ask, add seeking to that. And when you seek, add knocking to that. And, and the language is of intensity. Look in your notes, and I want you to write these things down because we need to understand how important this is. Because each of these words increases in intensity, and it answers questions like, well, what if I ask and I get no response? Then you seek. Well, what if I seek and I find him and maybe he's locked the door? Then you knock. And then what if I knock and it takes a while for him to come to the door? Then you keep knocking. Right? This is like, th this is what J Jesus talks about in, math and, in Luke chapter 11 later on. He says, we ought to always pray and not lose heart. You, you just keep on doing it. I love, so my phone, so I have this screening service on my phone. Like, I get a call from a number I don't recognize. I put screen call. And it says, you've reached this customer's screening assistant. Would you please tell them the reason why you're calling, right? And usually it's a hang-up, right? Or it's like, hey, it's Larry. I'm not picking on Larry today, but I am. No, it's Larry. Hey, want to know if you want to grab, like, oh, I didn't recognize your name. I, I pick up. And, but there's times when I've, I've literally hung up and they've called back. And I've hung up again, and they called back. Guess what? On the third or fourth time, I'm picking up. Has anyone ever done that? Like, it's, I, I feel bad for some of these telemarketing companies, right? Because they only call once, and it's like, but for the people who are persistent, guess what? I'm going to, I might start speaking a foreign language. I don't know who it is, but I'll just, you know, I'll pick up and be like, okay, you've called me four. Usually, if it's a three or four time phone call, it's someone with something important. Telemarketing company's not going to recall, like, okay, got to get a hold of this person. They don't care about me. But the person who's persistent, I'm going to go, this is Scott. And they're going to say, hey, you know, I'm in a difficult spot. This is a, Jesus says, keep being persistent. Keep being persistent. Why? Because you're his child. Look at your notes. Ask is an activity of neediness. The, the, the word implies I lack the resources, and I know God has the resources. So I'm going to ask, because there's a sense of, of need, and I'm going to tell you right now, this goes against what our culture instills in us, because our culture doesn't pride itself, <laughs> and I use that word intentionally, on teaching humility. Our culture doesn't think, you know, being dependent is, is a good quality. I'm going to tell you right now, if there's no humility or dependence before a holy God, you're going to miss out on a huge part of your Christian journey. You have nothing. God has everything. And so when we ask, we're, we're basically, it's an activity of neediness, which then leads to intensifying our prayer and then seeking Seeking is an activity of pursuit. Meaning I'm no longer going to be an armchair prayer, but I'm going to get out of my chair and now add activity to my praying and my asking. 
And so seeking something implies that I am going to find something that's been lost or whose location is not known, and it adds action and effort to my asking. And, I, and, and it's like, if you, if you have a pet, and your pet is not allowed to be outside but gets outside, guess what you're going to do beyond asking? You're going to be seeking. Cujo! Cujo! Where, oh, you guys don't have dogs named Cujo? You need to name your dog Cujo. Scare everyone in the neighborhood. Cujo, where are you? Like you set, you're no longer just saying, Lord, pr- please bring Cujo back. You're adding activity to finding Cujo. Now, here's the cool thing about seeking, and I want you to understand this. Seeking is such a special word in the Bible because whether you're talking Old Testament or New Testament, Jeremiah says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart, God says. Meaning there's this activity we're able to do that when we feel disoriented, when we feel lost, that if our heart is set upon God, we're going to find our rest in him. In John, it actually says that the Father seeks those who are going to worship him in spirit and truth. And it's the only place in the Bible where it says the Father seeks something. And so now what we have is you have a seeking of us and a seeking of God that is actually met now in relationship. Because all true seeking that ultimately satisfies is found in relationship to God. So you're out there asking and seeking after your dog, cat. I mean, we're not going to talk about cats. We'll talk about dogs. You don't find your dog. Guess what you start doing now? You start going to your neighbor's. Cujo, Cujo got out. You're going house to house. If the, if, the, if the animal is so important to you, it's no longer asking and seeking. Now you're, invo- you're, you're knocking on every door. Help me find my lost pet. And so knocking is an activity of intensity. It's interrupting people at dinner time. It's interrupting people in the middle of the night if it's so important. I remember having a friend come to my window about two in the morning, high school, right? And I, I, I rolled with some really <laughs> interesting dudes, right? But I had this guy just pounding on my window one night. I think we were juniors. He kept, and I'm just kind of like trying to ignore it, trying to pretend like nothing's happening, and he was just insistent. And he knew that I believed in Jesus, And at that window, I finally got up, opened the window, and his name's Troy, and he said, my dad just died. And I knew at that moment that I could not let him be ignored. It wasn't like, hey, let's just talk in the morning. It it was something that was so intense in his life at that moment. He got rid of all social decorum to wake me up and just say, I need someone to talk to. You see, ladies and gentlemen, Asking is the simplest aspect of praying. Seeking turns it into now this pursuit, but down the knocking, it signifies utter earnestness and total desperation. And, and I'm going to tell you something right now. Bruised and bleeding knuckles is a sure sign of you getting confidence in your prayer life. Try tweeting that one out right now. Bruised and bleeding knuckles display a confidence that you believe God will answer. I love what one pastor said. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It is laying hold of God's willingness. Remember, this is not about God and his character. This story Jesus uses is about the the, the persistence of the one asking. And let me just tell you right now, when we persist in prayer, what you're going to discover is that prayer is not about changing God's mind as it is drawing close to God's heart. How many of you have prayed thinking you're going to change God's mind? It's never encouraged in Scripture. You want to know why? Because God's a lot smarter than you. He's a lot wiser than you. See, prayer is less about any answer you're seeking to get and more about discovering the affection of a God who has promised he'll never leave you or forsake you. I didn't use this first service. I think they were C.S. Lewis heavy from prior weeks, but I'm going to give it to you guys. Somehow, I feel like this is what God wants you to know. And Lewis describes prayer as if God is this giant rock in the middle of the ocean and you're in this little rowboat and all of a sudden the storm starts kicking up and you throw an anchor to this big rock in the ocean and you start pulling that rope. 
Are you moving the rock closer to you or are you moving yourself closer to the rock? That's prayer. Prayer is not you bringing this immovable, steadfast, huge object to you. You are moving yourself to God, and that's what prayer does. It brings you into closer and closer alignment with God's wisdom and his will. Prayer doesn't change God. Prayer changes you. Wow. Because at the heart of it, it's about relationship. What if God gave you every single gift he could give you, but yet doesn't give you himself? You're still going to be discontented and unsatisfied. See, what you discover in the persistent prayer is this. There is no substitute for God. Psalm 73. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. See, this is what prayer does. It allows us to stop clinging to the things of this world, thinking that jobs and cars and relationships and sex and success are going to bring us happiness and that there's only one who truly satisfies those of us who are created in his image and that's relationship with the Almighty that we get to call Daddy. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus says, God promises you will find and you will discover and doors will be opened but they're not going to be probably what you thought they were going to be but they will always lead to him if it's sincere Spurgeon said this you know it's a good morning when you get Lewis and Spurgeon Spurgeon said this the Lord intends to educate us by non-success as well as by success and therefore causes us to sigh and cry until his spirit puts forth his power which now brings us to the second point, the delight of the giver. See, now Jesus shifts the focus, right? The first part of what we talked about is on the determination of the asker, that's us. Now we get to look at the delight of the giver, which is God. So we are not to equate the reluctant friend, the grumpy friend, as God. That's, it's merely not reflection, it's contrast. Because here's what we know, God is not a grumpy friend. Woohoo! We do know he is a gracious father. So Jesus says, look at God, verse 11. Now suppose one of you, dads, your son asks for a fish, you're going to give him what? A snake? <laughs> one of your kids asks you for an egg, you're going to give him a scorpion? Now I'm going to tell you right now, snakes and scorpions were harmful creatures in Jesus' day. And may I say for those of us that live in Arizona, <laughs> we can identify with a lot of scripture, can't we? But what m m father, mother in their right mind when their son, daughter asks for something, you're going to give something harmful to him. You're not going to do it. See, God always knows what is helpful for us. And he will always withhold what he believes is harmful for us. And how much more? Now notice the language Jesus uses. He's going from a lesser to a greater teaching. If, if, if you give good gifts to your kids and yet you're evil, by nature evil, there's even evil people that do good things. And how much more will God, who is perfect and holy, care for you who he's designated his son or daughter? See, you need to understand the delight and the desire of the giver. There is no reluctance in God in the sense when it comes to us praying. There's patience required of us. Can you write down that word patience? Because unfortunately, some of us have grown up in homes where we asked for something and mom and dad immediately gave us whatever we wanted. Now we call them Democrats. <laughs> just kidding, I'm just kidding. That, I just had to get that one in there, right? Yeah, so. Um, is it not true that we have a lot to learn when it comes to patience that sometimes our prayers are not answered like Amazon Prime delivery? Sometimes God says wait, even though he doesn't say wait, but he makes us wait. How many of us automatically conclude when it's not answered in our time frame, God said no? When in reality, God doesn't owe you an answer in any sort of time frame that you have. He always will answer according to his time frame. See, here's what you need to understand, is that we need to keep a simple fact in front of us. God is our father and we are his children, full stop, period. And that our Father will always keep the right to do what is best for his kids, even if we don't understand why it is best. 
the number one question my kids have asked me since day one, why? And the number one response I've always given them, you don't need to know why. I sound like a loving father, don't I? So what does a smart child do? They go to mom. I have a lot easier time saying no or even saying wait or saying maybe or saying this. I don't have to explain myself. But yet God is a good God and will give us what is helpful and withhold what is harmful. Our thing is not to give up. Can I, can I just ask you guys a, a, just a, a, a very important self-reflective question right now? Have you stopped asking God? Have you stopped talking to God? Have you stopped praying to God simply because he didn't answer you? Have you stopped because he didn't give you what you wanted? I don't, I don't know where you're at, but all I know is that silence is not the answer on our part. There's a persistence in keeping asking that God and Jesus obviously w- encourages us to do. I, I remember reading a story of a, of a couple who went to Ukraine to an orphanage because they were going to adopt a, a, a little boy. And they went to this orphanage in Ukraine, and as you might expect, it, it wasn't in the best of conditions. They walked into this room, a gigantic room filled with babies, and it wasn't the, the conditions that startled them. It wasn't the darkness, this low-level lighting that they had, had set up. It didn't startle. The smell, as awful as the smell was, it didn't startle them. They walked into a room that was filled with babies, and what startled them the most was that not one of those babies was crying. And the reason not one of those babies was crying because all those children had learned that their crying would not get an answer. There's a room filled with children who would cry and cry and cry, and they finally got to a point their crying doesn't help. And they walked out of there with a little boy, and they brought him home, and for weeks that child would not cry. And they said the greatest day was when that child cried. Because that child knew that they were in a different relationship in a different context where now if they cried, they wouldn't experience silence. But now when they cried, they would experience the love of a father or mother. Silence hurts us. Silence cuts us off before a God who wants to hear us in our sighs, in our whimpers, in our pleas, in our begging, in our crying, in our loud screaming, in our shouting. Have you ever done any things before God? Here's what I do know. The only answer is that you don't stop doing those things. But you understand that there's a God nearer than you can ever imagine and a God who promises he'll never leave you or forsake you. Don't take his silence as his absence. And don't take his lack of provision for what you think you need as the absence of him giving you what you actually need, and that's something different than you'd ever expect. Here's what God wants you to know this morning, that he is going to take care of you. And I'm going to tell you right now, probably one of the number one reasons he's going to take care of you is because his reputation's on the line. Because you and I will go forth into the world and say, our God is good. And we're going to talk about the ways that God brings satisfaction and contentment. But here's what's not going to work as far as when it comes to reputation and even the, 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 the promoting of the gospel is if you go forth complaining about all the things you didn't get from God. Can I just tell you, complaining and grumbling has no place in the Christian life. And I said a word first service. I'm not going to say second service because there's some kids present. But don't you think that complaining and griping is a spiritual gift? Can, I, can you go ahead and write that down in your notes? You go out there and you talk about how you're loved by God so much and then all your life consists of is what you don't have and how you're so, so mad at God because, you know, oh, he doesn't do this. I'm going to complain about this and gripe about this. Can I just tell you right now, you're not really showcasing the gospel in a positive way. Not that we sell the gospel, but when people of God live with this sense of satisfaction and contentment, when everything is falling apart around them, people want to know. And would you say, like, right now, we're all pretty desperate people, aren't we? 
I mean, think about what's going on in our world. R- wait, what, what is going on with our world right now? Oh, yeah, coronavirus. Oh, yeah, right now, presidential election. Oh, yeah, right now, really bad economy. Fill in the blank, right? Like, we are getting walloped from all sides. Would you agree with that? But the harder our circumstances become ought to be the moments, the harder we press into our love and commitment to Jesus Christ. If you feel your life is moving the opposite way, you need to think about the gospel once again. I'm not saying we go and walk around like happy, happy, joy, joy, like everything's like, you know, not like fake hallelujahs, but we have a deeper confidence, not that our guy's going to get elected, not that coronavirus is ever going to leave, not that our economy is ever going to change. We're praying for those things, but even if they don't, my soul will still be satisfied in Christ. And when people see you live with that sincere confidence, they're going, tell me about the hope that's in you. And then you get to lay on 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. As you sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, you'll be able to give an a, 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 a account of the hope that's in you with gentleness and respect. Because no matter what, you have a God who's good to you. Can I get an amen from somebody? You may not like what you, you didn't get, but let me just tell you, your God knows that you didn't need what you wanted. There's a sense of God saying, your prayer life is sustained by being reminded that God is your father, he is concerned about you, and his disposition is to care for you. Let that be the encouragement in your hearts. I love John Calvin. Oh, you know it's a super great morning when you have Spurgeon, Lewis, and Calvin. Listen to this. I love this. This, this, this caused me to stop and just pause this week. God does not answer our prayers as we pray them, but as we would pray them if we were wiser. Meaning, how many prayers have I prayed because of my immaturity? How many prayers have I prayed because of my short-sightedness? How many prayers have I prayed because of my lack of understanding? And then as I grow in Christ and mature in Christ and become more complete in Christ, I get to a place where I look back and go, Why did I even pray that? God knows our path. He knows our journey. He knows who we're going to become. And so he'll always meet us in a place that requires us to grow deeper in our walk. And that's why sometimes he withholds things because of where we're at maturity-wise. So not only do we have a father who gives gifts, how much more will your Heavenly Father take care of you? If, if, if a, any mom or dad generally takes care of their kids, how much more? But whether God gives you gifts, here's what I want to close with. And this is the greatest point this morning. We have a Father who gives Himself. Look at verse 13. And, and I love how Luke adds something that Matthew doesn't. This same teaching is found in the Gospel of Matthew, but Matthew leaves off the last section of verse 13. Look at verse 13. If then you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, don't miss this, shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Well, first off, I didn't ask for the Holy Spirit. But yet Jesus says that's the very thing you ought to be asking for. Let me put it this way. The highest good you should be pursuing is the Holy Spirit. Luke is keen on teaching about the Holy Spirit. This is why Luke and Acts talks about the work of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is God himself present within you as a believer. Now, we need to tease this out because this is where we are a lot of us fall short. There's two works of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life, and it's, it's important to understand the distinction between these two things. Number one, every believer is baptized in the Holy Spirit. So write down the word baptized. It's, these are bonus notes. I'm not going to charge you extra. Don't worry. Baptized. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, do you not know all who belong to Christ have been fully baptized with the Holy Spirit? 
There are some groups out there that will tell you that you're only partially baptized by the Holy Spirit and that you need to pray for the rest of the Holy Spirit. And how you know you got the rest of the Holy Spirit is when you sp- speak in tongues and when you perform miracles and healings. I'm going to tell you right now that there's a Greek word for that. It's called hogwash. That's not true. That, that's not true. If anyone is in Christ, they have received the entire Holy Spirit himself. You, you lack nothing. But, number two, write down this word, filling. Where we tend to miss understanding the work of the Holy Spirit is being filled by the Holy Spirit. Just because you're baptized doesn't mean you're filled Filled is a constant daily work that we have to do to engage God to say to him, I want to walk in obedience. I want to walk in reliance. I want to walk in independence of you because without you, I can't do anything. So God has given us himself so that day to day we have all the resources we need to glorify him and to live the lives that he wants us to live. Are you kidding me? More than any other gift God has given us, he's given us himself. And it's the filling of the Holy Spirit. Not that we pray like, Spirit, come to me again, but we give ourselves over to his occupancy and his mastery over our lives. We treat God as if he's some roommate that we just put up with week to week and hope we get the rent on time and hopefully they're not eating our food out of the fridge and they're not making too much of a ruckus, right? He lives with us, but no way is he going to tell me what to do. I'm going to tell you right now, when God moves in, he takes over occupancy and mastery over the house. He changes the decor. He picks the color of the carpet. He changes the furniture. And he tells you when to be home and when not to be home. We act as if it's the uh, annoying roommate, when in reality, he's now the owner of the house. And just like Abraham Lincoln, actually Jesus said himself, is this. And I said Abraham Lincoln on purpose. That's a, a cultural reference. Some of you may not understand. I'm getting old. I know I'm 50 years old. But here's what... The, the, a house divided itself cannot stand. When God moves in, the old master's gone. When the Lord shows up, there is no other Lord that shares the, um, the, the power over that house. He is Lord. He has taken over my life. The old is gone, the new is gone. Scott Morgan has been crucified, and now the life I now live, I live by, by faith. Trusting the new ownership is going to have mastery over my life every single day. See, being filled with the Spirit means my life is no longer mine. I don't live my life as if I'm the dictator of it. I live my life as if I have a creator who knows what's best for my life. He controls my marriage. He controls my kids. He controls what I listen to, what I watch, what, how I live my sex life or don't live my sex life if you're single. He determines who I marry, who I don't marry. He determines what I watch on TV, what I don't watch on TV, what I read, what I eat. Full control, full mastery. And if Christ is not Lord over area, every area of your life, he's not, control, he's not Lord of any area of your life. Did you guys just hear what I said? If he is not Lord over every area of your life, your finances, your health, your career, your relationships, you can talk about Jesus being Lord, but he's not really Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, there's one thing necessary in life, and that is the Holy Spirit residing within you. Listen to this statement. All fulfillment of need is an activity of the Holy Spirit within you. Anything you feel you need, the Holy Spirit is the answer. He promises to bless you. He promises to keep you. He promises to bring you peace. He promises to give you grace. He promises to give you communion between you and the Father. And he is going to give you something ultimately better than anything you could ever ask for. And that is relationship with the Father. Persist until you receive the Holy Spirit in power. How does God do this? Two things I want you to think about. When you pray, know this. God will guide. Why? Because sometimes in our praying, it's a waiting process. And when you're waiting and when God's teaching you patience, 
you don't just throw your life into just some sort of neutral mode. You continue to pray and you stay lockstep in, in step with the Spirit. You're in His Word and you're just continually allowing God to guide your path. Because waiting's hard. Secondly, God will comfort. Because I know some of us, and I'll speak from personal experience, God has said no to some of the things I've prayed for. And I, I'm going to tell you right now, those can be painful things. And in those moments of pain, God meets us and promises us he'll comfort us. Right? So here's what you need to meditate on this morning. God has given us himself. He's given us his son to die upon the cross for us. He's given us the Holy Spirit to now dwell within us and, and give us the power and strength and wisdom for daily living. What has God not given you? Exactly. Ephesians chapter 3. Look how Paul sums this up. Now, let me just tell you, the church at Ephesus is a, is a church dealing with struggles. And here's what I love about the letters of the New Testament, is that they're written to churches not unlike ours that are going through difficult times. Politics, economy, sin, lust, all this stuff, right? But look at Paul prays right in the middle of the letter. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Notice what Paul doesn't pray for. I don't pray for your emperor to, to take over in the, in the seat of power. It's not there. I don't pray for your economy to improve. It's not there. I don't pray for all diseases to be eradicated. It's not there. What does Paul pray for? that you would be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Nothing is more important than this, that you being rooted and grounded in love, rooted and grounded means you're permanently loved and, and in Christ, amen? You may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and that you may know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Tell me what you don't have that you really, 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 really want. And you really, 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 really want? If you have God, you have everything. And the person who has everything and doesn't have God is a pauper compared to you who has God and may not have everything. Church, don't give up in praying. Don't give up in asking. Don't give up in seeking. Don't give up in knocking. Jesus knows that you pray and you stop and you, and you stop because you think it's not working or you stop because you're not getting what you've prayed for or you're stopping because it's not turning out like you expected. And Jesus is saying to us this morning, don't stop praying. And if you have, start again, because blessed is he and she who starts to pray over and over and over again, because more than what you get, it's who you get in the process, and that is a deeper connection with your Father. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand, let's pray. Father, you're so good to us. Thank you for this morning. Thank you that... You invite us into the most intimate of all relationships. Closer than anything we could ever understand as a father to a child. You, because of Jesus, have adopted us as sons and daughters. And you have told us that we can come to you 24-7 with whatever's on our hearts and minds. And Lord, you're so good to us and you're so gracious to us that even when we ask with wrong motives and even when we don't even understand what we're asking, you don't break off relationship with us. But you teach us through your kindness and through your patience. You teach us that there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy us apart from you. So teach us contentment. Teach us satisfaction. And teach us to continue to persevere with the things in our lives that we think are necessary and the things that are urgent. And we're going to pray for you to ultimately be glorified no matter what the outcome is. Thanks for taking care of us.
Thanks for loving us. Thanks for listening to us. And for being a God who's closer to us than we can ever ask or imagine. It's all because of what Christ has done. Who is the mediator between us and you. And, and we who are now friends were once enemies and we just consider a relationship with you the greatest delight in all the world. Guide us and direct us. Be glorified in all things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. God bless you guys. Love you. Have a great day, all right?